There it goes. Uh, Jarleth, I we can't hear you all of a sudden. I'm sorry, Leslie. Oh, I had an audio error there. Okay, great. You're back. So uh, I guess I'll introduce myself first. This is Jarleth O'Neill Dunn. I'm director of the Spatial Analysis Lab at uh, UVM and also uh, head up our UAS or unmanned aircraft systems team. Turn it over to John. And I'm uh, John Budreski with AirShark and uh, right here in Vermont and we focus on uh, commercial industrial inspection um, as a service entity here and uh, we have quite a bit of overlap with UVM so we'll talk about uh, some differences today. Great, thanks. And so the way we're going to divide up this presentation is I'm going to do the first half and I'll talk about our fixed wing UAS and a lot of the applications that have come out of that. And then I'll turn it over to John uh, who will give us really some cool insight into how they're using sort of their multi-rotor systems for inspections. So I'm going to go through a litany of applications that we have done with our UAS since we've got over 350 flights. But first I'd like to talk about sort of why we went down this road and really we were after a number of things and this was heavily influenced by our experience with Tropical Storm Irene in Vermont in which you know we needed imagery of a certain location, had to be accurate enough to make measurements and have good positional accuracy, it needed to be high resolution, it needed to be current, and we needed to get it to people on time. And when we looked at the existing systems out there, whether they be manned aircraft or satellite systems, none of those were meeting those needs. And this came at a time, which is what you see on the screen here, where these commercial lightweight, relatively easy to use, mapping grade UAS we're coming out. And this is a system that we use called the EV. We actually have two of these. They're very small, they're lightweight, uh, made out of styrofoam, but they're extremely high tech. They have integrated flight planning and onboard GPS, and they communicate with the computer, and they have a pitot tube to sense the wind, and when they get knocked slightly off center, so they know to hold to taking the picture, and all those types of things. And these systems, like I mentioned, are really designed for mapping purposes. This isn't something you're going to fly over a bridge and try to find cracks with or generate a 3D model at least close range of a building. You're going to launch them in the air, you're going to define the area you want to map, and then it's going to map it. And so it's very similar to sort of like having an orthophoto program in your pocket, if you will. And really what we're talking about coming out of these types of systems are the products that you see here. In the lower left, we have ArcGIS Pro displaying our ortho-rectified imagery that came from one of our UAS missions. And then in the upper right there, using Quick Train Mob, a software that's typical design for LiDAR, we have a point cloud that's generated from photogrammetric process, uh, processing. So I mean, we have overlapping photos, and from that we can compute perspective and generate these beautiful 3D models. Now we should also point out that when we're talking about applications, there are certain limitations to these systems. So for a given battery, we're getting about 30 minutes of flight time. In that flight, we're really talking about, you know, maybe, you know, a couple couple hundred acres uh, max. Uh, we're going to be flying within three kilometers of where we are because we have to maintain positive link with our laptop, even though the system's automated. We also have to be able to see it under FAA regulations. Uh, we'll be able to fly in wind conditions in which you could get a small plane up there, and uh, when the wind gets really bad, you probably wouldn't want to be up in a Cessna, and we won't be able to fly there, and we can't do it if it's really raining or there's a lot of snow or anything like that. We typically deploy with a crew of two or two to five people, and right now we run both true color and color infrared camera systems. And to walk you through these examples, of course, we've been heavily uh, invested in disaster response. We've participated in some of the FEMA exercises in Vermont. This is exercise Hard Knocks, uh, which was done this past fall. And in that case, the situation was actually mimicking Tropical Storm Irene, in which we had a community that was cut off. This community was just a facility out at the National Guard base. But what they did is they lopped trees across the road, and then we went up. We were able to fly under the clouds that day because there's a very low cloud ceiling, so none of the other imagery assets were able to get up there. And we were able to identify these locations of blockages along the road and also show that other roads to that facility were clear. So that ability to get imagery as soon as you land is really, really exciting. Some of you may know that we deployed to Northfield this past fall, also got imagery there of the train derailment. 
once again, what's really nice about the applications of UAS in this case is that you don't have to be far away from the people who you're supporting. We can go out there and embed ourselves with, with the incident command system and get high resolution, detailed, geo-referenced mapping grade imagery. And these deployments can come pretty quickly. So in this case, you know, we're, we're on site within an hour of, uh, or less than two hours of really being requested. Um, instantaneously, we can get data such as this, that geo-coded uh, files, if you will, showing the point locations of each individual photo that we create. And then with some processing time back home, that's when we can generate these ortho-rectified mosaics. And really, most of our applications focus on these types of true geospatial products, which means we're taking hundreds of images, stitching them together, removing distortions associated with the train and the sensor, and generating ortho-rectified products out there. So these aren't just pictures. These are mapping grade products. And so where have we done this? Well, we also had incidents in uh, Barrie, Vermont, this past summer. You can see here there's a lot of area that's been affected by flooding. You can see that sediment. And so what's really nice about UAS, when you're documenting the extent of this damage, you can go out there, fly the mission the next morning after the damage, map the extent of that damage, and then bring in things like your property parcel database and then highlight those parcels which have been damaged. This is really important if you're applying for either state or federal funds because now you have a comprehensive and verified geospatial record of where that damage occurred. We're going out and working with a bunch of environmental consulting and engineering firms. And this is some imagery we gathered of a stream in southern Vermont, the Cold River, that's undergoing a stream restoration. It was also very effective during Irene. Uh, this is the nice imagery that we have, ortho-rectified. You can see the white pines there and their star shapes. You can see the species based on their actual not their spectral condition, but actually their spatial pattern. Uh, this is the existing, at the same scale, the existing USGS 10 meter DEM for the area. The LIDAR hadn't been released yet. And then right here, we have our digital surface model, which we generated from the point cloud. And you can really see the detail on that. But you will notice this area of triangulation here. That's the area where we're not able to see through the trees. So it's not the same as LIDAR, but it can be more detailed. And this type of data is really useful for these applications because here we are looking at that 3D point cloud, and then we can take that 3D point cloud and do things like stream cross-section profiles. So this would typically take a surveyor, you know, probably uh, two to three days to do one of these one of these streams. With your UAS, you can go out there, fly one of these streams within 20 minutes, and then have these cross-section profiles. This isn't to say you should do away with your surveyor, but it allows your surveyors to focus on those high areas of interest and do broader area mapping using your UAS. And because we're talking about 3D data, we can actually go out and do volume estimates. Some of you in the Burlington area may have heard about this uh, contaminated soil pile that they had done. Uh, they had removed it from an area near the Moran plant, and they had put it up in the parking lot in uh, Letty Park in Burlington. And so the city needed to get estimates of how much it would cost to remove that soil pile, but they didn't know how much volume they had. Well, you can go out with your UAS, fly that area, that's that soil pile, and you can see it's all fenced in there. It has weights on top of it. And then we can generate 3D models from that data, very, very similar to LiDAR data. We can cut a profile underneath that mound. And then using that, we can compute the volume of soil that they have. And this just took, I think the flight was 7 minutes and 20 seconds to do this, and then another sort of 20 minutes of work back at the lab to just do this type of processing. So really efficient ways to do this type of mapping. And we found that we're generally our volumes are within 5% of if you had deployed a very expensive solution. Uh, like uh, a ground-based LIDAR data. The high temporal resolution, I think, is really groundbreaking because in areas where you have events like flash floods, you can not only capture the flooding conditions, but we can monitor the conditions leading up to that flood. And when you think about using traditional methods, satellites, who often lack the resolution or you have cloud cover at the time, or manned aircraft systems, which are very expensive, UAS offer a very powerful alternative. So here we are using our color infrared camera. In March, you can see the Lamoille River there, completely covered by ice. Uh, April 9th there, you can see that the ice is melted, but we haven't had the snow melt yet. And then April 16th, we can see that we're in flood conditions at that stage. So because you have 3D data, you can also do other types of neat volume estimates. So for example, here we have a road. This is a 3D point cloud from the UAS. 
Here's the surface model for that road. Once again, it looks very similar to LIDAR. These point clouds are really great if you're not trying to look under trees. And let's say we have a flood condition and we lose a piece of that road, right? So the stream overflows its bank, cuts in and erodes this piece of road, and we need to figure out how much fill we need to put in that area to get that road back operational. Well, what's great with the UAS data is that you don't have to deploy a ground-based LIDAR sensor to an area that might be typically difficult to get data or in the case of bad storms inaccessible. We can have the UAS data. We can do elevation profiles of that area to figure out what the height of the road is. And then we can do the volume estimates there to figure out how much fill we would need to actually put in that area and then give you the volume. So that sort of shows you that area if we had to fill it in, which is really nice. One of the more interesting projects we've been doing in collaboration with the town of Plainfield is monitoring one of their streams, the Great Brook. And this has caused the town a lot of problems because of all the woody debris that comes down during a storm. That woody debris clogs the bridge, and the water finds a way around it. And when it finds a way around it, it does tremendous damage to that bridge. So the town had a lot of questions about how much woody debris was out in that stream. and how are they going to deal with this woody debris? Do they need to try to remove it? Do they need a bigger bridge? Lots of questions there. Now, you can go out and do woody debris surveys manually. Here's George Springston from Norwich University. Uh, the problem is the Great Brook's kind of a dangerous stream to be in. Uh, it is flood prone. There's a tremendous amount of erosion. And just being out there and inventorying all this woody debris along miles of stream is really time consuming. So we had started an extensive monitoring program of the Great Brook, and um, during that process of monitoring, the uh, bridge went from this to the, here's that aerial image, what you see earlier. You can make out here all the damage that occurred. You can see all those logs piled up at the bridge. You can clearly see the evidence of where the water went around it. So this is really great information, right? Sort of like the barrier example. Here we've got a situation in which we need to document the damage. We've got clear evidence here. But what was really nice is we were able to march upstream and do comparisons over time to see what had happened with all that woody debris. Once again, coming back to that question, you know, there's woody debris in the stream. How much of it is actually causing troubles during these storms? Is it just a few big logs that maybe you could go in with a chainsaw and remove, or is there a different situation? And what we found looking at the, uh, the imagery that we had collected at over five different intervals is you go from a situation like this to a situation like this. Is that the exact same area during the storm? And you see a lot of debris has moved. The entire channel has shifted, rocks and boulders have repositioned themselves, there's new erosion on the stream. This type of three centimeter imagery that you can acquire for the areas that you need before and after is really revolutionary. To do this for a manned aircraft acquisition uh, would cost you, you know, many times, tens, tens of times more than it costs for UAS. Here's just a close-up of one of those areas. So June 25th, this is pre-storm, so you can see there's been some erosion. We've got some large woody debris. Over on the right there, you see on July 21st, here's post-storm. So that huge pile of woody debris there, those four trees that are in that big clump, that's moved downstream, and you can see all the new erosion along the bank there, and also the repositioning of the channel. For, so for geomorphic studies, this stuff is really powerful. And then what we did here is we took that section of the Great Book, we broke it into these 100-meter increments, and that's indicated by these black triangles here. And for each one of those stream segments, we computed the debris lost. This was pre and post that big storm in July, and also the debris gained. And so what this told us, while we don't have tags on each individual piece of woody debris, that there's massive amounts of woody debris moving during these storms. And by the looks of it, especially since we see a lot of woody debris lost in that lower section, most of that woody debris is probably actually making its way through the bridge. Um, but a small portion of it's getting caught, and that's all you need to mess things up. And really, what the town of Plainfield, probably the solution for them is is a larger bridge. And it's this type of information that you can get from UAS because you're dealing with mapping grade geospatial imagery that you can go out, fly those areas when you want, get the data that you need at a resolution that we've never had access to before. So that concludes my examples there, and John, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you to show a few really cool inspection stuff. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. So here's, uh, let's see, a picture of me at AirShark again. Uh, we're focused on uh, commercial and industrial inspection, so I'll come at it from a different angle today, although we're um, 
involved in more and more uh, mapping for uh, projects that we see uh, for customers. Um, let's see here. So a classic example of some of the aerial inspection uh, today would be, you know, a wind turbine located on top of a mountain that's in a stressful, difficult to access environment. Uh, it undergoes a lot of environmental change day to day between temperature and weather. And customers like this need to inspect the leading edges of these blades. And then the cell, which is the top portion of the uh, the wind turbine, the lights, and the different sensors that are on top of this turbine. So these are the sort of uh, areas that we tend to inspect. Um, a typical, you know, big sample anyway. A lot of what we do is energy and construction, and specifically, um, we started out doing renewable energy. Um, another prime example for helping various stakeholders would be uh, looking at the big picture uh, before, during, and after construction of something like a bridge project, whether it's a ra railroad bridge or a, a highway bridge, uh, like the steel truss bridge here over a river. So there's some riprap, uh, there's some uh, sediment issues that can be assessed sort of at the big picture, and then as you're getting closer, you can start to look at uh, the bolts, uh, spalding of concrete and uh, structural integrity. Now, in this case, it's a brand new um, uh, bridge that was put back together, so there's not a lot wrong with it, but you start to do some 3D models and uh, even incorporate other sensors. Uh, you can find, um, for instance, uh, using thermal imagery, uh, different uh, animals that may be nesting in a bridge or, or whatnot, um, just as another example. Um, but that's sort of the big picture. Again, um, difficult to see, uh, dangerous or, or distant. You know, this is uh, some insulators on a power line after an ice storm. Um, using a pretty low resolution camera system, uh, literally in five minutes, we're able to go underneath the cloud deck after the storm rolled through here and quickly assess the situation and gather some images to see the health of this uh, particular pole, whether it's a crack structure or um, icing that's, that's occurring. So um, another sort of low-hanging fruit, at the end of the day, we're not flying uh, two or three miles at this point out into the distance. There's uh, manned aircraft and helicopters that do that, but if we need to do some close-in inspection or go up to 200 or 400 feet and look down a line, we can help an uh, asset manager or a lineman with that. Uh, this was an interesting project down in the Boston area. Um, when we were looking at it from the ground, we saw these cool electric vehicle parking spots underneath the uh, solar carport, which is one of the largest ones I've seen in New England. And the customer asked us to create some videos and images more for uh, project documentation um, and perhaps for insurance. I'm not sure where else the imagery was used, but we were able to get above this uh, energy structure in literally five or ten minutes and get all sorts of different angles of uh, images. And the different stakeholders that were using uh, some of this imagery was the racking manufacturer. So there's a lot of steel racking and they wanted to use it for sales and marketing support to acquire more business. But the solar panel, panel manufacturers are interested in the imagery as well as the engineering and construction team that installed the actual project. Um, this is a part of a larger project at a parking lot. It's, it's uh, probably a third of the project you're looking at right here. So having these fly-throughs um, and just the raw images is useful in terms of um, really gaining an understanding. People need to, um, uh, they don't really realize what sort of data we can acquire. So keeping it simple is sometimes the best uh, result and sometimes it's just uh, some simple images and video. Uh, here's an example of uh, some project documentation of a solar farm uh, during construction. And you can kind of see it's a blurry image, probably from a hillside, I believe, across the street, and probably from an iPhone or something from a project manager. And, yeah, you can see there's some steel in the ground. The project's, you know, moving along. Yeah, there's, there's some information here. And when we go above an array, we're able to take a bunch of photographs and stitch them together using photogrammetry. 
and provide much more information and insight for uh, the developer. Uh, in this case, the blue squares you see above the solar farm are called cameras, and there's uh, a couple hundred cameras from the drone shooting the image. Each of those represents a shot down, um, and the overlap is anywhere between 50 and 70 percent for each image. So this is the beginning of the uh, the uh, ortho photo process, and you can see there's some um, yellow dots, if you can see clearly at certain points in the array, and those are ground control points. So what we will do is uh, a lot of our sites already have survey and control, so we'll just put targets out, and we'll be able to see those targets from above, and using those we can stitch the image and get our uh, X, Y, and Z accuracy well under a meter, sometimes close to you know five or ten centimeters uh, in general, but sometimes tighter. Again, the top-down view with a couple of those control points visible. So what, what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at um, we have a fence line to the left of the image. So we're looking at the health of the fence line. We have a, a wet area where there's a depression. So we're looking for um, uh, basically any impacts to the wetlands post and pre-construction. Um, we can see... Um, if you look to the left of the array, there's an uh, area where there's a depression and some discoloration of uh, soils. Um, perhaps there's animal grazing, uh, but there's also some maybe settling of uh, pipes and electronic uh, wiring beneath the array. So these sort of things are sometimes difficult to assess on the ground. Uh, vandalism, soiling of the solar panels, and... Uh, um, Thermal imagery is very valuable for these customers to look at the health of their assets. So some of our, many of our projects are with uh, commercial clients, and we have a non-disclosure, so I'm not able to show all of the imagery, but to give you an idea of sort of what we're looking at in general. And then some of these customers uh, will end up using uh, just the bare imagery for uh, sales and marketing or website applications. So. Not only are we going out and assessing the health of the array from an O&M perspective or a system commissioning perspective, and by O&M I mean operations and maintenance, we can provide, while we're out there, some pretty pictures, which is useful for them, and uh, they really appreciate that. So this is an oblique looking at a site that's probably five or eight acres in size. And the reason you see some discoloration on the PV panels, I believe, is because they're polycrystalline panels, but that's not too important. Um, again, uh, an example, I think Jarvis mentioned being underneath the cloud cover on a sort of a day when an, an aircraft really, in order to take off, needs an instrument flight plan, instrument system, instrument rated pilot, and then it's up and above the clouds typically. So in this case, we're able to deliver uh, project documentation images on time because we can go below the cloud deck on a sort of a nasty day to provide those images to the customer. And, you know, zooming around the site at low altitude with something that's 5 or 10 pounds versus 1,500 or 3,000 pounds is much safer, so uh, we're not a hindrance to folks below uh, circling in a light aircraft at 500 or 1,000 feet, which is uh, uh, fairly uh, dangerous at times in order to get high-quality photos, especially obliques. Um, so, uh, I believe there was a 3D model built, but I don't have that image there. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with Q&A and have plenty of time for Q&A because there's a ton of applications, and we could spend hours talking about a myriad of applications, but I think we, we had a good start today. Um, and maybe focusing on some of your application-specific questions to begin with would be useful. Here's just a quick example of the, the myriad. Um, and if you have regulatory questions or other items, Jarlath and I can look at the chat window or um, feel free to uh, contact us afterwards as well. I've got uh, some contact information here on the very bottom of the screen. Uh, let's see, the, these first two resources, rather, are um, useful for project planning if you may have a project. Uh, airmap.io is a really slick tool to sort of assess uh, the airspace around an area before um, you can decide if it's even feasible to use an unmanned system. Um, 
and FAA.gov slash UAS is a good resource. Those guys are working hard to incorporate these systems into the national airspace. So Jarlath and I are pretty well versed in, in terms of the regulatory environment. And um, all of our contact information with UVM is on this uh, either the phone number 656-3324 for Jarlath and then 552-0935 for Airshark. So with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Are you seeing anything in, come in, Jarlath? Yeah, I've got a few questions here, John. I was typing uh, answers to, but I'll just I'll just uh, rehash them here quickly, and then I think there's one for you. So one was what kind of software can be used to get the cross-section profile. So the point clouds are generated using PIX4D. That's the software we use. Uh, uh, John at Airshark, I believe, you use uh, Agisoft, uh, Photoscan. These are very similar. They're digital photogrammetric processing packages. And then we use Quick train model by applied imagery for actually a lot of the analysis that you see, like the volume computations and the cross-section profiles, simply because quick train model was designed to work with LIDAR data and it's extremely fast, so it's, it can be tens to sometimes hundreds of times faster than traditional GIS packages. And that's important because we're talking about point clouds in which you may have uh, 40 points per square meter. Another question was, how do you identify woody debris under forest cover? So what's really nice about UAS is that you can control when you fly. So if you're concerned about certain types of shadows, uh, maybe you're uh, worried about leaf-on conditions, well, you can fly during leaf-off conditions. You can fly when the sun angle is correct. So these are camera systems you're not going to see through the forest, but this is a stream, and generally there's a lot of deciduous species along the stream, so as long as we fly under the right conditions, we can see those woody debris, and we've got really high resolution. Uh, another question here, I don't know if you have had birds of prey uh, John, uh, we've had birds of prey show strong interest, shall we say, in our UAS, uh, but fortunately have not been attacked. I know I've heard of systems uh, being flown in Africa that have been attacked and destroyed, and I also know uh, my students that have gone to work for SenseFly who have had, done, have had to do repairs on some of the systems based on birds. I haven't had any issues of regulators um, being resistant to UAS because of a, a threat to birds. I think the birds are more of a, a threat to us. Any thoughts on that, John? Yeah, I, I was talking to a, a helicopter company, and, and you know, 95% of their work day to day is in the altitude airspace of you know zero to 250 feet. So the birds of prey that sometimes you have to see and avoid, uh, because we're not using transponders yet on these this equipment is you know manned aircraft, and oftentimes it's it's helicopters that are in the area. It's not every day, but we have been out and we've seen helicopters operating in close proximity. So there is a responsibility uh, to stay away from birds of prey, even the bigger ones. And uh, as the as the technology improves with transponders and uh, sense and avoid technology, that will uh, only help the situation. Great. Uh, another question here is that is it necessary to do radiometric correction for UAS images, especially if you want to use the spectral information? So uh, the software that we use, the digital photogrammetric software, will do color balancing. Uh, one of the key things I try to tell people is that the real advantage of UAS is two things, high spatial resolution, high temporal resolution. And people often say, well, can you put hyperspectral sensors on it? Yeah, you can get a fancy multi-hundred thousand dollar hyperspectral sensor and put it there, but do you need that when just using a simple color camera, you can actually tell what species is, is there? And so those sensors are out there, they're available, you can put them on the UAS. Um, I think it adds complexity right now, as I see it, to a lot of post-processing and really, I think, ignores what the real advantage of UAS are, which are that, once again, that high temporal resolution. So you may see species green up at a certain time because you're mapping them at the right time, and you've got you know, single-digit centimeter resolution imagery. I think there's another question for you, John, here about um, the kind of deliverables that you have after a wind blade inspection, and they were asking, do you produce videos yep. or infrared pictures? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. The, a lot of customers just don't realize what the capabilities are, so keeping it simple in terms of raw deliverables. And sometimes it may be just having the customer or the engineer out with us looking at a live feed. So we'll have a live feed of whatever the drone is looking at, and if we're circling around a wind turbine, they can see immediately 
uh, just like they would be doing on the ground with a pair of high-power binoculars. Um, in terms of actually deliverables, we'll provide them up to 4K quality video and uh, high-resolution still images for something like a wind blade inspection. We don't have a formal report. Uh, in terms of large solar fields, we'll use GIS to identify the exact position of uh, certain solar uh, cells that may be need to uh, send boots on the ground to look at them further or something like that. And then I think there's a question for me here. Uh, explain your procedure for quick georeferencing. So that was where I showed that uh, Google Earth example. And in that case, what we're doing is, is each picture that we take, so once again, we're doing this very similar to uh, a traditional orthophoto mapping project where we're snapping hundreds of still pictures. Um, each one of those pictures gets geotagged, so it's in the JPEG header. So as soon as we land and download that information from the UAS, each one of those photos is geotagged, and the software that we use to post-process the data uh, within two minutes will give us a, a KML file, and every little dot on that KML file shows those pictures. So that's that's how we do it, and um, it's sort of built into the workflow. I think the next question for me to um, identifying tree species other than white pine. Uh, yeah, that's another good question. I, once again, that comes back to, I think, the, the thing I mentioned before is that the real advantage here is not only that you can see uh, the individual species um, by their configuration, but especially if you know if they, um, you know, if their leaves change color at different times, you have that type of information, uh, you can clearly see that. So as, as long as the species has some sort of, you know, dis something distinct about it, either its shape or the leaves change in color, then, then you can generally do a decent job mapping. And that doesn't mean it's, it's perfect and it's not a replacement for your traditional uh, forestry mapping, but because you have control of when you're flying, you've really got amazing capabilities where you could get out to your forest stand that you're interested in and fly every week for four weeks during the, uh, uh, during the fall. Um, I think John, I this one's for you. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. The solar thermal mosaic uh, question, I think, can you do a, a 3D model of, of a solar thermal um, image or, or basically whether it's a building or a solar farm, for instance? Uh, the answer is yes, it's, it's challenging. Uh, just having the uh, useful imagery from the thermal camera to come in requires, you know, a lack of wind because you're outside in an environment that's typically windy and the moisture changes. So it's it's one is getting good data and it's easy to get really bad data. So um, we're, we're trying to concentrate on going out at the right times to collect the data and just beginning to work on the 3D uh, thermal mosaicing. And someone asked here about the opinion of using UAS for community-wide collection, and uh, I guess I'll preface that by saying that um, there are some much larger UAS systems out there that, of course, you can purchase, and I think many of us are familiar with what we see on television, things like the Predator or the Reaper, and there's a billion-dollar communication system, and someone sitting in a building in Nevada can fly it over in the Middle East. Um, it's important to know that once you start getting above a few pounds for these UAS, uh, especially the fixed wing systems that we use, you need to start to use a runway. And then in the case of John, I think if you have your multi-rotor systems, you know, once you have a 15-pound a multi-rotor system carrying a 10-pound LiDAR sensor, if that thing falls from the sky, you could do some tremendous damage. So you've really got to be careful. So these are small systems. They, they are limited uh, for area mapping. You know, five square miles, I think, is is a little bit on the the large area side for some of these systems, but you could get out there and and um, you know do it over time. I think the real advantage of UAS from a mapping perspective is not to replace the existing base map imagery that you're getting as part of your statewide orthophoto program. What's really great though is that if there's new construction for somewhere or there's specific interest perhaps in a wetland, you can go out, fly that imagery, and just bring it in, overlay it on your other stuff, and you've essentially updated your orthophotos for the areas that have changed. So here in Vermont, you know, we're sort of on this anywhere from a five to ten year cycle for orthophotos. We don't want to do away with that, but if there's new construction for somewhere, we can go out and fly that area now and update the uh, the ortho base imagery. Do you have any thoughts on that, John? No, I think I think uh, that's pretty much answers that. I mean, uh, there's another question: um, How do you use GIS to make identification for solar panels 
um, using the basically that we didn't go over the process too much today, but uh, using photogrammetry and those 100 or 200 images on a 15 or 20 minute flight over a five or 10 an acre solar farm, uh, the, the, the new software that allows you to stitch the images into photogrammetry, whether it's PIX4D or Agisoft PhotoScan, uh, can produce outputs for GIS modeling and also will produce uh, CAD outputs as well for survey people. So if there's uh, folks that need a simple CAD output, uh, we can do that. So it depends on the deliverables, but by having ortho-rectified imagery in each image with an XYZ, that's how we're able to find out kind of where we are and go back in time, which is uh, re really useful, especially as we develop uh, things like heat maps for volumetric analysis or changes in temperature or uh, structure of, of buildings. And someone had asked about um, UAS for water applications. I probably should have included one, um, so I just took over presenter control, if you don't mind, John. So here's a project that we did in Lake, uh, Lake Tahoe area. Uh, what you're looking at right now on my screen is Worldview 2, 50 centimeter resolution uh, satellite imagery. So really, uh, you know, the, the top of the line uh, commercial satellite imagery out there. And when you're looking at things for stuff like submerged aquatic vegetation or substrate mapping, really tricky to do using this type of data because you don't control the window with which you're acquiring the imagery. So here are those little white specks that you see are waves, so not ideal conditions. Let's go ahead and look at the UAS. Here we are displaying at the same scale. Not only were we able to fly it at a time where there weren't waves by doing it early in the morning, but you can see the advantage of having three centimeter resolution imagery in terms of being able to detect this submerged aquatic vegetation there and really map out these, uh, these invasive species and substrate materials for the lake. I will say that one of the big challenges you have on using UAS over bodies of water is not only that you might, if you have a problem, your, your UAS could end up in the drink, but the ability to do the uh, photogrammetric image matching, so finding common tie points between these hundreds of photos, overlapping photos that you create, once you start going too far away from land and there are no clear common features between them, the matching breaks down. So uh, really for these systems when you're flying low, you know, the 400 feet FAA mandate or even lower, uh, you're looking at sort of really shoreline type applications unless, unless all you want are the, the geotag photos. If you're just happy with geotag photos, those will come out just fine. But if you want these detailed, really nice ortho photo mosaics, those will fail when you get too far away from shore and you don't have those common uh, mapping points. Uh, curious about um, rough cost of UAS setup, like the one you've been using. I mean, uh, uh, in general, uh, we're using a multi-rotor system. We try to use the smallest system we can for uh, a lot of our air shark jobs, and that depends. But uh, one of the larger hexcopters, uh, which we built and uh, received an FAA and number four, you know, anywhere between ten and twelve thousand uh, dollars of of cost, uh, not including the sensors. Uh, and I think Charlotte can speak to the the EB, which has been used the most over there. Sure. Yeah, we've been using uh, the EB systems, and the base model will run you mid twenty thousands. Uh, the RTK model, so real time kinetic GPS correction, so single digit centimeter accuracy under good conditions, that'll run you fifty thousand. And I think John, we're sort of both of the opinion that uh, the the amount of money that you spend on a drone is a small fraction of the cost that it it takes to become a UAS operator. So uh, you want to think about all the legal things. You know, you want to put in, you know, probably six months for that, uh, for that process. You know, pilot's license, your Section 333 exemption, all of that. And then there's, you know, you want to get in 50 to 100 flights to really become proficient. Um, and then you need the IT backbone. You're going to be generating terabytes of data from this. You want either cloud-based or local systems capable of processing massive amounts of data, so multi-core workstations with good graphics cards and, and lots of RAM. So, you know, the twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever you spend on your UAS, that's a small cost of, of getting it started. And I think John, you you and I are probably both well into the six figures of our UAS programs for startup costs when you consider all the time that we've put into becoming proficient in this. Yeah, the uh, yeah the some of the it's really fun when you have a uh, a customer that hasn't used UAS data before just to get them out there in the field. I think I wanted to like just add that that 
having uh, an engineer or uh, you know some manager of a, of a site come out and, and look at the the data not only in real time but the, you know the following day when we produce a, a deliverable for them they're just uh, always amazed and uh, it is a process because expectations are key in terms of you know what are you going to provide how are you going to provide it and uh, sometimes there's just too much data so skimming it down so it's it's deliverable in a format that's usable is something that we've kind of figured out but it's there's uh, constantly improvements but seeing a happy smile on someone's face at the end of the day is, is keeping me going for sure. I don't know about you, John. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, along those lines, John and I did a previous webinar, so if you missed it, you can go to VCGI's YouTube channel and watch the recording, but that one was very focused on choosing a UAS contractor, and I think what's, you know, of course, we're, we're biased here. John and I work with people on this, but I think what's really nice about working with someone in the field, at least to start off, is it gives you a chance to figure out, uh, will UAS work for your project? What are the considerations? And by having a UAS vendor who knows what they're doing come out and fly for you, you really gain a good understanding of the data. Because like I said, people still have these perceptions of drones that come from the military-grade systems that are billions of dollars. and the UAS that we're talking about are great, they're really, really capable, um, but there's a lot of things that they're not going to be able to do that sometimes people think they're going to do. And then other times you're really surprised at, at what they can do and the quality of the data and the fact that, you know, in both the cases of John and I, you know, you can have us fly one day um, and then the next day we'll be able to turn around and, and give you geospatial products. And you think about the last time you contracted for aerial imagery or LIDAR, when did you get, uh, you know, 12 to 24 hour turnaround? Um, someone asked here about photo targets. Are they necessary? So I think, Bill, there you're probably talking about ground control points. Uh, the answer is maybe. Um, so depending on what kind of system you use, so in our case, if we just use the standard onboard GIS, um, we can, we're, we're always within two meters horizontal accuracy and generally within one meter. Um, horizontal accuracy. If we use our RTK system, as long as everything's working well, uh, we're within 10 centimeter accuracy. However, uh, often the only thing we have to compare it to is 50 centimeter resolution aerial imagery. So if you really want to know how you're doing, you probably want at least reference points out there put in by a surveyor if accuracy is paramount to you. And if you want to ensure the absolute best quality, depending on the system that you'll do, you'll want to lay out ground control points. And, and this depends. For example, for our stream corridor mapping, you know, laying out ground control points, absolutely not feasible. But I think, you know, John, when you're out doing like a, a solar farm, you know, taking the time to put in ground control points, probably when you need some sort of at least uh, minimal ground survey of the area is, is definitely what you want to do. I think the questions are slowing down, so I think uh, we're hitting 10 minutes to the top of the hour, so I appreciate everybody's time, and uh, feel free to contact uh, either of us, and thank you, Leslie, for putting this on, BCGI. Thank you guys very much, and uh, just want to point out that there were a couple of questions about whether the webinar is being recorded, and it is, and just in case you didn't see my response to that, uh, if you go back to the VCGI website, which is vcgi.vermont. Dot gov, you will see a link to our YouTube channel, and that's where the uh, recorded webinar will be posted. Vermont G or VT Geospatial. So thank you very much, John and Jarlath, for giving us all those great examples, and I hope that everyone got a lot out of this today. I thought it was really interesting. Thanks. Great, thank you, Leslie, for putting it on. Thank you.